Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, Elder Canada at Redeemer Fellowship. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. It is cold here. It is not that it's cold. Windy, it is windy, no, it's snowy, it's, it's not gross. that cold. I just think you're we a left, baby. We left Illinois where it was cold and it's nasty up here. Mm, you know, here's the, here's the, they're right what they say. Yeah. They do say dwarves can't really handle. They don't say that. They say that that's dwarves can't handle the that's cold. Not a thing. And this, that's this, the this, thing. thing. All right. And I think for, for you right there, uh, this is not cold. What are right, we talking can about? We, can we just tell people where we're at? What are we doing? Where we're at? We're, we are up in Minneapolis. We are going to the Bethlehem Conference mm-hmm. for Pastors and Church Leaders. Yeah. That just rolls off the tongue. Oh, my gosh. They couldn't do like, it was, it's, you know, it's, it's Piperian. You know, it's not, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to so be like, so it's a bit it's not going to be like, winded. Is that a, what you're it's trying not to be a, a, a conference called like context. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to do that <laughs> empire. That's not going to happen. So we're here and, um, you know, we're excited to, to see some of our friends yep. and meet some people. And we last minute got a chance to, um, sit down with somebody that I've been reading for a long time. Somebody that's influenced me a great deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Don Whitney. Now, uh, Don is the founder for, of the Center for uh, Biblical Spirituality, and um, you can find that at biblicalspirituality.org. But he is also the, um, the dean, the associate dean of the School of Theology and the professor of biblical spirituality at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Don, thanks for making the time to hang out with us tonight. Yeah, Joe, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I know it's got to be an honor for you to be on my show because uh, well, you know, my I mean, show, my but, show. Uh, he, I mean, listen, he knows. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't it's know okay. you. Yeah, he just no. met you tonight. DW, I'm sure tell, him, a, tell him how close we yeah, are. Yeah, it's an honor for me to be on anybody. <laughs> so. Yeah, I remember. Um, I was sick the night that uh, it was 1994. I was sick and I couldn't come to the evening service. And that was the night where you were there lecturing on spiritual disciplines or teaching preaching on spiritual disciplines. Mm-hmm. You were a local pastor in the yep. area. Mm-hmm. And so I was, a, I was a young Christian, and I couldn't make it, and my buddy said, I will get you a book. So it was a first edition hardcover of Spiritual Disciplines. Was this Steve mm. McCoy? No, no, I didn't know Steve. No, this is way before that. This is way before Steve? Yeah. So, right. so uh, this guy uh, got the book, and he had it signed. He brought it in, and uh, he said, I got it for you. And I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, he signed it. And I thought, like, nah, I don't really care about that. He's like, no, 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 you got to look. And so I open it up, and Don's penmanship is like <laughs> oh it's legendary it, it is oh. legendary look now he oh. no he, those aren't cigars he he pulls out <laughs> he pulls out a leather pouch and it's it's got it looks like cigars are in there but they're amazing fountain pens oh goodness. he is legendary for his penmanship and his fountain pen wow uh, can we call it an obsession uh, I'm going to call it an obsession. Well, so uh, yeah, uh, I'd rather well, not. But some well, people do. What would, yeah. you, what would you? What would you call it? A, a hobby. A hobby. Yeah. yeah. A passionate. What, are you passionate about this hobby? Uh, I'm an enthusiast. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting story. I mean, back when I was in Glen Ellen, I actually got into it uh, for ministry purposes. Really? My wife had given me a very nice fountain pen, and I used to write a little three-line birthday note to everybody in the church. Oh wow! And I, my penmanship was illegible. <laughs> And so I got a little workbook of 10, 15-minute do-it-yourself lessons. Mm-hmm. And after I did them, I said, unless I'm in a big hurry, this is what I'm going to write. And my practice was writing these these letters. Mm. So I had a nice pen, nice stationery, and I would intentionally do this. And after about six weeks, it was my uh, normal penmanship. And hardly a week goes by now, I don't get some kind of comment like you just right. did about pens or penmanship. So uh, really, I, I mean, I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Second, I am a writer, yeah. so you know, I use pens a lot for that purpose. Third, I use them for ministry purposes. And you know what? I, I would encourage uh, any any of your listeners who are pastors or, or who are in you know ministry uh, today. A personal handwritten note is the height of personal touch. Oh yeah. I ask my seminary students, when was the except for special occasions? When was the last time you got a personal handwritten note from someone? You know what the usual answer is? They can't remember. Never. Right. Think about that. Never. So today, if you write just a three-line boilerplate note to people who visit your church Mm -hmm. or someone, uh, the anniversary of of a spouse's death or something like that, number one, you can be sure they'll read it because they never get anything Mm -hmm. like it. Unlike Mm -hmm. a a junk email or something else, you'll be sure they'll read it, and, and it will impress them. Uh, you know that it's it's a personal touch. So, 
Um, and on top of all that, you're going to laugh, but this is a minor point, but it, you know, it's worth noting. Uh, if you're ordained, uh, these are tax deductible <laughs> because it's office supplies. Right. The IRS yeah, doesn't yeah, care yeah. if it's a box of Bix or if it's a nice uh, yeah. fountain pen. It's so. going to last you your mm-hmm. life and your kids' life. Well, I've got one of my dad's pens, right. and it looks as great as it did uh, when he had it. And, you know, I never uh, use it without thinking of him. It doesn't leave my desk. And I've got a lot of pens. I, I can restore old pens if they have, a, like, a lever filler type. So I've got a lot from the teens, the That's 20s, great. the 30s. Oh, wow. And they look and write as well as they did then. And so... Um, you know, that, that's another one of the great things about it is their, their, their longevity is, mm-hmm. uh, right. is great. Well, I, this is, this is, uh, this is very, um, pleasantly surprising mm-hmm. because I know that you're into this. I didn't expect that it would come up at yeah. all. Mm-hmm. And, um, because Jimmy and I, we nerd out and there's a group of us at our church that we really geek out on pencils and different kinds of graphite, um, that are you know made around the world, Japanese pencils and all of this, um, because we love to write. We're writers mm-hmm. and, uh, we like that feel of laying down, you know, lead or graphite onto paper. And so there's a lot of journaling that happens. And, uh, I've recently begun to explore fountain pens. Jimmy yeah. is a big fountain pen guy. Steve McCoy is a big fountain pen guy. So, um, this is Nowhere great. Nowhere near your level. Mm-hmm. So I aspire. <laughs> so we'd, uh, we, like what's a good, is it like a Lammy? Like what's a good fountain pen for somebody to get started? Started with like if you want to recommend to somebody yeah a lot of people say <clears throat> a lot of people say i'm kind of interested but i sure don't want to invest a lot of money yeah, and, yeah. and so uh i recommend the pilot metropolitan okay it's usually about 15 dollars retail oh, wow mm. it's good quality pen pilot makes excellent pens they've been making them 125 years and uh with any pen if i tell someone you know if you get into it and you say this isn't just isn't for me well Give it to me, you know. <laughs> and so uh, that's a good start. Doesn't break the bank. You need yeah, yeah. that. You'll need to make. Uh, next step up would be it's actually Lamy, a German it's name, L A M Y. That's the next step up. It's about twice the price, but you get a great variety of nib choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you can get an italic or stub nib that's a lot more expressive. Gives you thicks and thins line variation, like a Coca Cola logo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I really like that. And so you have a lot of nib choices uh, in, in that, and then it, it goes up from there. So uh, some people get into it, and they say, hey, I like this, but, you know, I would like maybe a pen that uses blue ink and then one that uses black ink. Yeah. And uh, you because you can chase ink, but it's a bit of a hassle to right. thoroughly clean a pen. It'll take five to ten minutes. And so uh, then they learn about different nibs and things they can do. And so, you, you know, one thing gets to another, and that's how people end up with multiple pens because they just – and they enjoy it, Yeah, you know, so. Well, it's a discipline, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's analog, right? It's, uh-huh. it's tactile and that's something that you can hand on. And I, I'm one of those guys that we do write letters to the people in our church just as one of the ways that we check in with them, yeah. uh, the members. And, uh, yeah. and, yeah, the response is always incredible. So yeah. this is awesome. So so exciting. But what we want to talk about um, is we want to – Encourage people yeah. to, um, you know, one of the things that we do here at d and is, is we want people to have um, a growing, robust theology that is deeply biblically experiential. Um, we want them to take spiritual discipline seriously. So uh, we've promoted your, your, your books in the past, yeah. um, everything from, you know, Praying the Bible, which is such a great little book. I, I, first of all, I love that it's little. Little is always, you know, if it's good, little mm-hmm. is amazing. Um, so that's a great book, a help to so many. But then your classic uh, spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about that and maybe a few disciplines that are neglected. Yeah, but I think bef- that's a good idea. But before we get into that, can you talk a little bit about this idea of spiritual disciplines and calling it, you know, biblical spirituality? Um, I, some people see, I've met a few people and they seem a little uncomfortable or confused about mm-hmm. the language because they might hear, you know, somebody talk about it who's a little off the wall theologically. And then they have somebody like you who's reformed, you know, Baptist Orthodox guy using that same uh, language. So can you just unpack that for us and help us to understand what is biblical spirituality and what are spiritual disciplines? Well, that's a, that's a big question. A lot of topics there. Uh, but uh, everybody's spiritual today, right? I have a survey from the front of USA Today where a majority of atheists consider themselves <laughs> spiritual people. <laughs> Amazing. Try to Amazing. find anybody who says, you know, I'm just not very spiritual. So everybody's spiritual today. And in light of that, we need to define what we're talking about, especially in the church. So uh, uh, we have a, a program at Southern. It's called Biblical Spirituality. My professorship is that of Biblical Spirituality. I have a website, Center for Biblical Spirituality. And people still may not know what that is, but whatever it is, we're trying to be biblical about right. it. So mm-hmm. that says something. And I, I would 
say that everyone has a theologically driven spirituality. We're striving for a consciously mm, theologically right. driven spirituality because you do what you do in your spirituality because you believe what you believe in your theology. So you pray to Mary or you don't right. in your spirituality because of your theology. Yeah, You pray the Bible or you don't because of your theology of, the, of Scripture and so forth. So... Uh, we strive for a consciously, theologically driven spirituality, a theology that's built on solid exegesis from uh, the Bible. So that, that's what we're about, which means that we want to uh, uh, limit our uh, practices, though that those that are found in Scripture. Some are clearly organically related to the gospel, like the intake of the word in mm-hmm. prayer. Uh, Romans tells us uh, the Spirit causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. So we believe the gospel, mm-hmm. and dwell by the Spirit. We, we pray. Those in dwell by the Spirit cry, Abba, mm-hmm. Father. So that's organically connected to believing the gospel. Some are, are less so. And I, would, uh, I can make somewhat of a biblical case for even some that are fairly obscure. Um, but we do have a text... <clears throat> We do have a text in 1 Timothy 4, 7, which says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Sometimes I have been criticized for using the term spiritual disciplines because there are people in the field of spirituality who are um, um, uh, less biblically driven, let's say, or people who had come from a more liberal perspective who use terms like spiritual disciplines. Maybe more mystical. Yes. Mm -hmm. So So just just a misunderstanding of of your approach. Yeah, and and then when they hear me use the term spiritual disciplines, yeah. they assume there's some sort of connection that's right. not there. So I've often been challenged, where do you use this term? Where do you get this term spiritual disciplines? Well, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, discipline yourself right. for the purpose of godliness. Mm. Well, what kind, what kind of disciplines are spoken of there? To do what it says, to discipline yourself, those practices or habits in obedience to that command would be disciplines. Mm. What kind of disciplines are there? They're not, they're not bodily disciplines. Otherwise, bodybuilders would be the most spiritual people on the planet. More importantly, the very next verse says, for bodily discipline is of little profit. Mm. So what kind of discipline is it? Spiritual discipline. So spiritual disciplines are those practices found in the Bible that promote a closeness to Christ and conformity to Christ. And so that's what my spiritual disciplines for the Christian life book is about. My spiritual disciplines within the church mm-hmm. book is about. So practices that are found in the Scripture that promote uh, Christ likeness, and um, uh, so I have sometimes been associated with some beliefs and practices I repudiate. Really, because I well, number one, I'm just in this field, and I use the term uh, spiritual disciplines. Oh, so everybody, you, you're you're down with prayer circles, right? You 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 like the prayer circle? Is that what, is that what you? Well, you know, like a lot of these things, like mysticism, Joe, it really determined, it's all <laughs> right. determined by the definition. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in my Southern Baptist church where we had prayer circles on Wednesday night. Which faster meant, divided up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah people holding hands. Yeah. I'm all for that, you know. Uh, drawn a circle on the floor and standing in front of it claiming like... Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't see, yeah, it's weird. you know, I don't see anything like that in the Bible. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's often clarifying to say, where do we see that yeah. modeled or taught in the mm-hmm. Bible? Something like a labyrinth walking, you know, mm-hmm. which is hugely popular right now. Ain't nothing wrong with walking in a labyrinth. <laughs> as far as that goes, no. <laughs> I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's adiaphora, you know, it's things yeah. indifferent. It's how you use it right, or the, right. the importance you place on it or mm-hmm. the exclusion of some biblical disciplines to the exaltation of that. Yeah. So can I walk on a labyrinth path and pray? Yeah, just like I could walk down a country road yeah. mm-hmm. and pray. But saying that I have to do that or that that's superior to... Uh, a biblical discipline, or the labyrinth is essential to my spiritual. Or that it's somehow That's effectual, a right? It's like right. this makes yeah. this makes your prayer effectual now, like as opposed is, to just kneeling by your bed, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Now, listen, I, I I would like to walk a labyrinth. I don't even want to do a prayer labyrinth. I don't want to mix them personally. I'd rather just do one or the other. You just want, I want to enjoy want the walk. labyrinth, or <laughs> I want to enjoy my prayer. I don't want. Yeah, I don't you don't, want, you don't yeah. want. Wait, so you don't want your joy to mix in your prayer life? I get it. You no, want no, separation don't, between don't put words in my joy mouth. and prayer. Don't it's put fine, words in my fine, mouth. It's fine. So when um, when you're looking at uh, at this issue of spiritual disciplines, when you're teaching on it, when you're talking about mm-hmm. it, um, how do you explain to people the difference, the relationship between the means of grace 
and spiritual disciplines. What is what is the distinction there? Is there a distinction? How do you unpack that? Well, uh, a lot to that. I think there is there we can say in one sense there is well let's dis, let's define uh, means of grace in terms of saving grace and sustaining grace. Okay. And I think any discipline, any act of obedience can be a means of sustaining grace. I mean, there's grace in prayer. God yeah. mm-hmm. graciously blesses us in prayer, so thus prayer is a means of grace in that regard. Uh, any act of obedience can be the same way God blesses obedience. He delights in our obedience. So that, in one sense, can be a, a means of grace, but not in the sense of uh, the gospel, like we get through the preaching of the Word of God, not like means of grace that we're given as, as the Word of God demonstrated in the Lord's table, uh, for example. So the spiritual disciplines are means of grace in the sense that um, God blesses us through these ordained um, uh, means He has chosen in Scripture that if we pull ourselves into those paths, so to speak, mm-hmm. That he will bless us. I mean, I, the analogy I use in that regard is um, Zacchaeus. Okay, so he knew the path Jesus was taking. He's going to go down this street, and when he does that, he'll go underneath this sycamore tree. Mm-hmm. So he got himself into Jesus' path, so to speak, climbed that sycamore tree. Jesus came underneath that, and Jesus changed Zacchaeus. Right. Zacchaeus did nothing that made it happen. He just got himself in this the a path. Puritan, in the right the Puritans spot. talked a lot about yeah. this path idea, like paths to the cross yeah. and paths to Christ. So God has 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 built certain paths mm-hmm. by which it pleases him to go down. And we call these spiritual disciplines. So mm-hmm. the Word of God, prayer, worship, serving, fasting, right. uh, these kinds of things. And if we will place ourselves on those paths and look to him in faith, we can expect mm-hmm. to meet him there. Just like if someone on a Sunday morning wakes up and says, I don't feel like going to church today, but by God's grace, they have the desire and the power to overcome that inertia. They get there and they look for the Lord by faith. Mm-hmm. They can expect to meet him there because yes. God has ordained public worship and so faithful public worship where the word is preached, the word is sung, the word is prayed, the word is displayed in the table and so forth, you can expect to meet right. God there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He walks down that path. Yeah. And so that's what the, the biblical spiritual disciplines are that practice by faith, not mechanically, not automatically, but by faith, if we look for him there and these means he has ordained, we can expect blessing. Mm. So let's talk about a couple of spiritual disciplines, yeah. just a few of them. <clears throat> now you, you list them out in... In the book Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, and we encourage you guys if you haven't getting that, if you haven't uh, got that book, you need to get it and then read it. Uh, we'll have it, a link in the show notes. Oh, to the, for sure. To the, revi- the the updated one. The yes, revised, revised and updated, twenty fourteen. Yeah. So you you want this? It's the kind of book that you're going to read, that you're going to want your kids to read, oh, yeah. that you're going to want the people in your church to read. Uh, it is really foundational. Christianity. It's it, it, it in a sense, it's core Christianity when it comes to the habits of the faith. So um, you you it's it's a must read. Every we have everybody read it, and I don't know anybody personally who doesn't love that book. Oh yeah, they, like they love that book. Everybody at our church redeemer loves that book. So, um, but there are some spiritual disciplines that everybody seems to be pretty jazzed about. Hey, oh, prayer, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, everyone wants to talk about the prayer, the, the Bible, scripture reading. Get your Bible app. Get your journaling on. Get your journal like on. That. But what about? What about the? Like, they don't like them all. No. What no. about the, the kind of? Well, let's say neglected ones. Yeah. Because I mean, like, I mean, I mean, you can't really tell by looking at me, Doctor Don. Mm-hmm. But I'm not really good at the fasting mm-hmm. aspect of spiritual discipline. So yeah, well, people people don't want to fast. You know, you know, the only people that that I know that are into fasting are into intermittent fasting for uh, cutting weight. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yep, for like a, uh, getting yeah. jacked, getting their abs on. Yeah. That, that's why they get into fasting now. But now, but that's a different motivation. Oh, behind, totally. That's not behind the kind of fasting talking Don's about. talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So why is fasting, in your, in your understanding, you've been at this for a long time now, uh, why is fasting f- completely forgotten in most churches, and um, why would it be important to rediscover it? First of all, it's forgotten like anything else because it's not been taught upon. Mm. All Reformation begins with teaching. You can't expect people to do what they've never been taught to do. They're not going to be biblical financial stewards if they've never been taught biblical financial yeah. stewardship. Yeah. So if they've never been taught fasting, you can't expect them to practice that. 
And why hasn't it been taught? One would be, you know, in general, under a lack of preaching of the word, mm-hmm. it's mentioned more often in the Bible as than something as important as baptism. Seventy-seven mm-hmm. times, by my count, for Ooh, fasting. Wow. Seventy-five. Oh, I never knew that. You hear that? Seventy-five Baptists? for <laughs> baptism. But how, wait, how many times is potluck mentioned though <laughs> in the New Testament? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'd have to look at it again. But, uh, yeah, see, you don't yeah. have all the answers. Yeah, here, obviously. Are. So, I mean, a failure of preaching the word, but mm-hmm. but second, it's often overlooked because it's hard to be a public advocate for something you're not right. doing. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So you just can't stand up and preach hard about appealing to people to fast when you don't do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are probably the main reasons, failure to preach the word and a failure to practice the discipline. But in general, I, I think it's, I've never met anybody who, who didn't in discussing it say, you know, well, I, this is one I struggle with greatly because it's the only one we actually feel in our bodies. Mm. Hmm. If we read our Bible or don't, we don't necessarily feel that in our bodies, but fasting is something that you physically right. feel and it's a feeling we don't yeah. enjoy. <laughs> Right. Uh, which maybe we need to explain why hunger actually serves you and helps you in fasting, that the goal is not just, uh, you know, physical suffering and endurance. That's works orientation. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's the only one we actually feel in our bodies. Mm. Even solitude, you, you may feel that, you know, kind of in your soul, so to speak, but uh, but you don't feel it in your body like you do fasting. Mm. And uh, we don't like that feeling. What, why should people fast? I mean, let's, let's say the Bible presents it as something that we should do. Why yeah. does God mm-hmm. command us to fast? What what's the what's the purpose? Yeah, behind? I don't think we're commanded, but I think the 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 expectation is there. Uh, in in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in Matthew six, you've got this parallelism: when you pray, mm-hmm. uh, when you give, when you fast, right? Mm. And when you pray, and it gives instructions. When you Give and gives instructions. Don't let you write in, you know, and that, this sort of thing. And when you fast, so there's this expectation. But more clear, Jesus said, uh, when the bridegroom is taken away, then they will fast. So the he wasn't about it, and his disciples weren't about it while he was here. Yeah, he was they, really right. So the expectation was when his he was taken away, which he is now. He there, his disciples would fast, and then in the early church. Uh, we know they fasted. For example, they were ministering to the Lord and fasting when called, yeah. the Holy Spirit said, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. And uh, they would themselves fast before they appointed elders in cities. So um, we're not commanded, but you know, there's that expectation. That's mm-hmm. a big surprise for a lot of people. Um, and uh, what was your question after so, that? So <laughs> why, why, what's, what's so good about it? Why yeah. does God want us to do it? Why okay. is it an expectation in the Christian life? Um, well, let's remember fasting is God's idea. It wasn't developed by some monastic group somewhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. It was God's idea and it's not a works based thing. It's not, if we cause ourselves to suffer enough, then, then God will, will be impressed. And it's not a spiritual hunger strike, but it's uh, Piper calls it a, an intensifier of, of spiritual desires. And mm-hmm. so, uh, it's a way God has ordained for us to, uh, seek additional power in our praying. It's a way God has ordained for us to express uh, things to him. And I think it works like this, that, uh, and here's why your hunger serves you, and you want to feel hunger. And we, we probably should say a word in a moment about what about the many, many people in our churches, diabetic, pregnant, migraines, right. yeah. who, who can't do this. Providentially hindered, yeah. yeah. But uh, you, your hunger serves you in that when your stomach growls and your head aches and you say, man, I'm hungry. Well, your next thought is automatically going to be, oh, well, duh, I'm hungry because I'm fasting today. If your next thought is, how long till this is over, mm-hmm. you're doing it wrong. Right, mm-hmm. right. That's a miserable, self-centered experience. But your next thought ought to be, oh, and I'm fasting for this biblical purpose. Mm-hmm. In my spiritual disciplines book, I list 10 per- biblical purposes. But the most important probably, and that we see most often, is prayer. So that you you pray, let's say, for your spouse or the conversion of a child. So it looks like this. When your stomach growls, your head aches, you go, man, I am hungry. Oh, that's right. I'm hungry because I'm fasting today. Your next thought should be, and I'm fasting to pray for my spouse. Yeah. I'm fasting to pray for my child's salvation. So your hunger serves you. It serves your larger purpose, which is to pray for your spouse or child. So you, your hunger serves you by reminding you all day long. Mm-hmm. Even in the midst of a conversation like we're having right now, as I'm talking, you might be 
Oh, I'm quickly praying. Big time. Yeah, you might be <laughs> right now. Quickly <laughs> praying, or just driving in the car. I mean, just yeah. at random moments of that all day long, yeah. you're reminded to pray. So that's why There's you a want physical to feel pressure on you that's reminding you constantly. exactly. Yeah. So right. your hunger serves you in that regard. It's your friend. It, it helps your your larger purpose. Mm-hmm. And is, is there never a time you want something from the Lord more than you want lunch? Yeah, mm. you want someone to be saved. You want a prayer answered. You want something more than you want that's the good. next meal. And I love the way kind of you you brought up what Piper had said. Because I think oftentimes we do think of it as a spiritual hunger strike. And mm-hmm. I, I love the way that phrase there and even Piper saying an intensifier to kind of drive you deeper, to push you along, to, yeah. to, uh, to get you kind of almost to that next level of reminding mm-hmm. you of yeah. your of, of prayer. Yeah, and his, his book on the subject, which is, is not so much a manual of fasting, it's a collection of, of sermons f- about fasting for special purposes, yeah. fasting for the unborn, fasting for missions. But I love the title. It's called A Hunger for God. Mm-hmm. And the idea is fasting is when your hunger for God exceeds your hunger for the very food God made you to live on. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's be reminded God made us as creatures who survive by eating. And there, there are a few people, a very small number of people, who will uh, you know, do what the Bible says, don't turn what is good into covering for evil, who will say, oh, I don't have a sinful eating disorder. I'm fasting. Yeah. And so we, we have to keep right. those people in mind. Yeah. For most of us, though, like everything else, there are ditches on both sides. Sure. Most of us eat too much. Yeah. There are people who sinfully eat too little. Huh. And so we, but the, the good news is God has made us as creatures who survive by eating, and it is the will of God for every one of us almost every day of our lives to eat. Mm-hmm. But is there never a time you long for God to do something more than you want lunch? Mm-hmm. So that's that's when you fast, and God has it's God's idea. So that's, now what about? Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that's really helpful, and if I could put up like another point on it uh, in terms of like the benefit of it is in on the rare occasions that I have fasted, uh, one of the big takeaways is that I'm that I'm kind of the impression afterwards um, when there's been the occasion for fasting, the impression is, um, wow, like you said, we need food to live. I, I, I denied myself and I denied this food that I need to live and I was forced to um, depend on God, rely mm-hmm. on God even more and experientially. And so when I come away from it, um, it the, that, that experience of, in a sense, being forced to rely on God in the midst of actual hunger, it, it, it fits you for the circumstances in regular life where you're going, now you're going to have to go without Okay, your air conditioner broke, you know, which, you know, to somebody like me, that might be a reason to get really angry uh, if I'm hot, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> um, but suddenly it's like, wow, that's not, that's not missing food. Mm-hmm. That's just a little hot. Yeah. So now you can depend on God in these other areas. You've, you've, in a sense, learned it on a smaller level or on, the, on another level through, through fasting. So it's almost I, like a perspective. Like, yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 sort of, it sort of fits you. The experience of fasting and denying food for yourself for the purpose of, of relying on God fits you for going without in other areas of life. At least that was something that I had thought of. Mm-hmm. Well, I was, gonna, I was gonna uh, just uh, make sure we hit on um, those that are providentially hindered. You, you kind of yes, wanted to yes, mention thank them. you. Yeah, I require my students to fast at least twice during the semester, okay. and uh, I always have students that are pregnant who get migraines if they don't eat yeah. uh, regularly, or especially diabetic. So um, there is. Um, uh, in the book of Daniel, an illustration of what is often referred to as a partial fast. You remember when uh, they were going to be forced to eat the king's yeah, food, yeah, and they yeah. said, no, we just eat water and vegetables for 10 days. You know, he made that appeal. And so uh, th- that is a, a, an example of temporarily modifying the food. Okay. And so uh, the, the way that's historically been applied is one of two ways. If If people... Have to eat. And by the way, you know, we want to say we're, we're never asking anyone to do anything that would put themselves in any have bodily harm, them or their, their unborn child. So we want to make that, that very clear. Course, yeah. Don't want anyone to take understanding about the biblical teaching on fasting and do themselves or anyone else uh, harm. Um, so how can they participate, though? I, I found generally where there's a will, there's a way. Mm. And so people can participate by either... If they need some sort of balanced nutritional intake, they eat smaller portions. Right. Or if they can get by with just one simple food, they eat just rice, mm. just bread. So they don't get the pleasure of eating. Yeah, yeah. Or they don't get completely full. 
but they get the minimal nutritional intake to keep them from having a migraine right. or, or having any diabetic problems, which you don't want anyone to have. But they still feel some sense of lack mm-hmm. physically that reminds them uh, to pray. It, is it legitimate? Because a lot of people use this word fasting and they apply it to everything. Mm-hmm. Um, are you comfortable with people using the word fasting? I'm fasting from TV for a week. Well, you know, uh, people as diverse as Richard Foster on the left and Martin Lloyd-Jones on the right both apply the term fasting to things other than uh, food, mm-hmm. fasting from any legitimate freedom. Just say fasting with the television or social media mm-hmm. or, or mm-hmm. something else. When they get a sense that perhaps it's controlling too much of my life, it's taking too much time, it's captured my heart too much, and I need to demonstrate some mastery and dominion over it by backing away, I think it's it's proper to use that. But strictly speaking, the Bible only refers to fasting from right. food. Mm-hmm. Good. That's so, you're saying, so you're saying it still could be a good practice. Yeah, yeah. And to know, call it for, fasting for because yeah. it communicates, and it's the idea of I, I'm kind of starving a particular desire for a spiritual purpose. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't quibble with that at all. Um, it's just that, strictly speaking, the Bible only speaks of no, fasting in, in from that food. that one sense, yeah. So then for you talk, you mentioned for your seminary students, you, you try to encourage them to do it twice a semester. Yeah. Now, I mean, I'm trying to get a little bit more personal for mm-hmm. you. How, how often do you kind of find yourself? And it might just be a situational, you know, thing for you yeah. based on, on things that are going on around. Well, you. in the Bible, we see regular fasts. Uh, we see uh, occasional fasts. Mm-hmm. Um, and we see national fasts and um, a congregational yeah. Fast. So when I was pastoring, I had a regular fast for a while. Um, uh, back when I was in the Glen Ellen area, I would go home on Wednesday nights um, about six o'clock or so, have a quick meal. I was just five minutes away and come back for the seven o'clock service. But it began to dawn upon me that, you know, tons of people were coming in for various things at six o'clock Wednesday night mm-hmm. prior to the seven o'clock service. And that other than Sunday morning, that was the busiest time of our church. We had more people there than any other time. And I started thinking, I, this, I need to be here. And this is a good ministry time. So I started regularly fasting on Wednesdays and making myself available. I'd, yeah. So that became my mo- most profitable counseling time of the week mm-hmm. was before the service on yeah. Wednesday night. So uh, I would regularly do that on Wednesdays. But since then, it's been more of an occasional basis. Um, which we see frequently in the Bible, like like Jehoshaphat, there was an invasion in, by the Assyrians, and he called a fast throughout all Israel. And uh, Paul and Barnabas would fast on the occasion of appointing elders and, and things mm-hmm. like that. So it tends to be more uh, as the occasion arises or as I sense uh, you know, the need to draw near to the Lord, yeah. or more particularly just sensing uh, more earnestly God answering prayer. That's good. So why don't we uh, why don't we talk about one other discipline, yeah. and we'll we'll do this one a little bit more briefly. Just we like to hear you encourage people uh, in the discipline of silence and solitude. Actually, you know, especially Joe, I, I would like for you to no, teach Joe. Listen, hang on, silence. we did a whole we did an episode. <laughs> we did on a whole the discipline. Episode. I heard that one. Did you hear that? One? I did. <laughs> did you like that? That's one of the two that I've heard. I think. <laughs> uh, I think that it, that ended up being the last one. <laughs> We got people. We got. Yeah. We did that. We did April Fool's thing, and we quoted yeah. you. I think, and yeah. we played yeah, you the did. book, and then we practiced sound yeah. solitude for twenty five minutes. So I feel like that was pretty good. People yeah. were so mad. Uh, they, well, they were like, You're, "It's broken. Oh, God, we're <laughs> not working. Yeah, fix your. It's not my computer. It's you. It's." I you. bet you got a lot more uh, replies uh, on the on yeah. the social media right oh, than yeah. any it, others. It was yeah. good. It was that was Jimmy's idea. We were, we sat on that for months. Before months we, we went <laughs> on that one. Um, okay, but uh, seriously, um, silence and solitude. Yeah. Uh, some people are going to hear that and go, well, that sounds like some mystical nonsense. What, you want me to do this at a prayer maze? And then other people are just going to be like, I don't even, I've never even thought about this. So can you introduce us to the concept of silence and solitude, why it's valuable, and how to get started? Yeah, this would be one of those that uh, I can point to a biblical basis in terms of example, yeah. but not command. At, uh, at least on at least five occasions in the Gospels, it tells us Jesus got alone right. with the Father. Yeah. 
And he is our example of walking with God, an example of spirituality. Now, he's much more than our example. Yes. He's our Lord, our Savior, our King, our substitute, our mm -hmm. judge, our friend. But he's not less than our example yes. of walking with God and, and of spirituality. So five times he got alone to be with the Father. And, and if he did, then certainly so do we. Now, I have a – and the silence uh, would be – a silence before the Lord. Three times in the Minor Prophets that phrase is used. Be silent before him, mm. all people. So it's not just some effort at kind of getting some reintegration of your mindset. It's a silence before the Lord, mm. a God-focused silence, in other words. And uh, the solitude is often just to practice other spiritual disciplines. So I, I say to people, look, you don't like that term, but if you support the idea of a quiet time or daily devotion, <laughs> that's what you're doing. It's called a quiet time. Yeah. Guy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guy. <laughs> and if you find quiet time, <laughs> you don't like that terminology. If it sounds quaint or hokey or whatever, call it your time of silence and solitude. Yeah, you yeah. know, So uh, it can last a few minutes. It can last days. Sure. Um, so... It's certainly not a, you know some some mystical thing, but I I have a colleague at Southern Seminary, Rob Plummer, who wrote an article know, uh, Rob. in the ETS Journal, uh, saying that silence and solitude actually, and, and he talked with me before he published it, aren't disciplines, but they are the setting in which other disciplines mm. are practiced. I'm totally fine with that. You know, uh, it feels just, like a discipline because it feels like to get alone. And to practice silence takes effort. So Intentionality. It like, it sounds, yeah. yeah, it sounds like a discipline to yeah. me. I, so, think, Rob, I think, Rob, I think you're wrong. But I'm going <laughs> with Don. I, well, no, but I think what he's trying to say is that you're, you're practicing that silence and solitude. In the midst of scripture, yeah, yeah. in the midst right. of right, so, yeah. yeah, to get along with God, so you can practice other disciplines like meditation on scripture, yeah. like prayer. You may be fasting during that time, or write in your journal, mm -hmm. a godly learning by reading Christian books. So you, you can be practicing, you know, half a dozen other disciplines yeah, exactly. in the context of solitude. As long as people are doing it, I don't care whether you call it a discipline or just a, no. A, you're an right. Occasion you're right. where you practice. Discipline. You're right. Mm -hmm. It's a discipline. Rob's wrong. It's okay. Uh -huh. It's okay, Rob. Uh -huh. When we have Rob, you know, Rob's smarter than I am, but he's not smarter than Don. So, um, <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> so, this is some really crazy smart people over there at Southern. Um, okay, so uh, maybe just give them a, a, a piece of a piece of counsel here. Hey, uh, and I, I agree with you. I think we are inundated with noise yeah. and information. It is worse now than when you wrote this book. Like, oh, yeah. the, the need for silence and solitude now yeah. is just critical what it get, how, can, how is it possible how is it possible for this you know some young millennial dude living in a postmodern world uh post-christian context technology everywhere uh how is he gonna practice silence and solitude well for starters don't have something on all the time uh the tv on just as background noise computer music going while you're at the cube all the time um i i just no scientific basis for it. I just don't think that's healthy mm -hmm. to have noise all the time. I mean, we're the only generation in history for which that's been possible. Mm -hmm. I often use the illustration of my grandparents who married in March of 1919, and my grandfather would take a bucket with his lunch in it and a bucket with water and head out to the fields, and the only sounds he heard all day were the sounds he made, mm -hmm. and my mother's first memory is of him singing as he came back through the hedgerows in the evening are the sounds that God's creation made. Mm -hmm. The sound of the mule mashing the earth in front of him, the sound of the plow tearing up the ground, the sound of the birds and the tree lines. Because there's no planes flying over. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no tractors in nearby fields, no cars bumping on the dirt roads. No earbuds. Yeah, it was in. quiet. And my grandmother back in the farmhouse before the kids came along, the only sounds she heard all day were the sounds she made working around the kitchen are God's creation through the open window. Mm. There's no radio, mm -hmm. certainly no television. There was no refrigerator hum, no air conditioner hum. TVA hadn't come through there. There's no electrical hum of any kind. Mm. It was quiet all the time. And you can think when it's quiet. Right? Well, it forces you It forces you to engage right, right. mentally on a different level than when you're constantly distracted. Mm -hmm. by and so if they had read their Bible and chose to meditate on Scripture, they could do so pretty much all day without right. interruption. Well, in two generations later, it is totally reversed. And, you know, I have this little electronic brick uh, in, in my pocket here that, uh, you know, can keep me with visual and audio, audio uh, uh, information entertainment 24-7. Mm -hmm. We're the awesome. first generation that's happened. Awesome. I love those well, things. They, well, they are. I mean, praise God. Who wants to be without it? I mean, right now yeah. I'm 600 miles away from my wife, yeah. and if she 
had a need, and I have a 90-year-old mother in, in a, a memory care unit, and if something happened to her, they could let me know right now. Yeah. Praise God. That, mm-hmm. That's good. Um, and so, you, but we, the, the problem is that can overwhelm us and overrun us, and just we don't need to have something on all the time. So you're saying get into the habit of turning some stuff off just as you're yeah. doing your business, just yeah. as you're going about your day. Yeah, just to get, I mean, give your ears a rest in one sense, just like your body needs mm-hmm. rest, your mind needs rest, our ears and our, our focus, our attention. I just don't think it's, it's healthy. It just can't be good for the mind to have something you're processing all the yeah. time that's external. Yeah. Not just, I mean, we're, we're always thinking all the time. But I, I think that distracts us from doing what the Bible says in terms of meditating on Scripture day and night. Mm-hmm. Um, and second, so number one, don't have something on all the time. I know, I know people of all ages who cannot be oh, yeah. at home, whether it's an apartment or a big house, without the TV on all the time. Yeah. Now, I get it. If you're doing housework or something, you just want to have some background noise and look up at the news every once in a while. I get that. But when you can never... 24-7, I mean, mm-hmm. I had a roommate in college that couldn't sleep without the radio on all night. <laughs> heavy metal, you know? Oh, I like this guy. Oh, which, that yeah. was one oh. semester. That was one semester. We <laughs> oh, were I say, did you room with Joe? There is no way that can be good for <laughs> your mind when that kind of thrashing is going As on all night As a metal aficionado, <laughs> I don't go to sleep listening to metal. So let me just say, that's not good for you. So just don't have something on all the time. And second, I mean, you have to be intentional about... Uh, Turning everything else off so you can focus on yeah. the Word of God, on the things of God, and realize we're the we're the only generation in history that could do this. Yes. So when we place it, what seems so normal to us, look, every one of us has the smartphone, every one of us has something going on all the time. We got to realize we're the only generation in history that could do that. So um, we have to be intentional to get away from this stuff. Yeah. And we need to every once in a while. Man, this is really really helpful yeah. and. Uh, Dr. Whitney, we we love your ministry. We uh, you have such a Thank great you. reputation, and you have you have really good style. You guys got to we'll put a picture up yeah, uh, we'll of uh, uh, nice because yeah, oh yeah, he's, he's always well, he's good. good style. I'm here at a conference good. and I'm speaking. No, and I travel no, without luggage. Oh, oh, I see you everywhere. I've seen you at Chili's I, and that. Okay, listen, I was <laughs> yeah, at a, yeah. I was speaking at a conference. <laughs> like, I was like the opening speaker at a founders conference. Oh, opening. And, uh, well, no, they did. They, they, oh, they, they, they let the small fry do oh, the opening, the devotional talk. So I was doing it on Psalm 51, and Dr. Whitney was there, and I'm like, hey. I didn't bring a suit. I, I'm probably all right. You know, I was wearing a pullover. And do you remember this? You're like, I, I kind of. You're, you're bringing it back. You're yeah. like, yeah, you need to go put a coat on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, can, I do have a coat. I'll go put it on right now. Well, and I think you said I have one. Should I put it on? And I said, no, I yeah. think you looked at me and you were like, put that coat on, son. <laughs> I think it was something like that. And I was like, oh, no. Um, and we we do uh, we really appreciate you. We want we, you guys need to go get um, the books now. Is is praying the Bible the most recent book? Uh, no, family worship. Oh, family is most worship recent. Came out after and, that. and praying okay. the Bible mm-hmm. came out about uh, a year before that. Okay, so family worship. Yeah, I know uh, Pastor Pat has highly recommended that. book. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a great book. It yeah. is good. So um, if you're looking at family devotions, family worship, that's a great resource. Pick that up. Um, praying the Bible is an excellent tool to get. It's gonna what it'll do is it's gonna just it's going to adjust yep. your prayer life so that it is going to be healthier. It'll flow better. It's really gonna connect you the discipline into Scripture in real mm-hmm. practical ways. And then of course spiritual disciplines. Is it ever for the Christian life? Four. 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 Spiritual, disciplines, uh, spiritual disciplines for the Christian life. All that's linked in the show notes. Yeah. So go ahead and pick those up. And um, you can follow, they can follow you on, are you on the Instagram? You on, yeah, on, on, on Facebook and Twitter primarily. Yeah. Face, Facebook and Twitter. At Don Whitney on Twitter and then Don Whitney on Facebook. All right, see. Oh, he's, go. Jimmy's got like J Fowler underscore 63. I don't back. have no <laughs> oh my underscore. Gosh, I have no awful <laughs> score. It's, oh, we can't just have like Joe Thorne or Don Whitney. You got to yeah, do I'll, that. Well, okay, I was okay, behind whatever. on the I, social media game. Yeah, I know, you're because you're like 20 years old. You're super young. I'm not stuck. 20 years old okay. um, guys come on <laughs> alright so Don we know you gotta go you got stuff going on tonight thanks for making the time we thank really you so appreciate much. you yeah. and uh, we'll let you know when this drops alright thank you thanks guys uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Facebook slash Dr. Devotion you can head to the website drdevotion.com there you can contact us you can sign up for our email blast you can hit up the store and sign up for the 2018 uh, conference uh, Dr. Devotion conference on the spirit of the church I'm a little bit nervous because Dr. Whitney are you going to come to our conference I'm going to put him on the spot Oh, he should. Oh, you should it's the first I've heard of it. Oh, 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 that was awkward. Okay, well, you know, it's it's the second one we did our yeah, know, had our first, know, conference, uh, first conference in a, in 2017. 20, yep. 
and we had over 200 people show up. Great. And mm-hmm. now uh, we've got our second one going on 2018. Got Doug Logan coming in. Doug Logan coming Wait in. till you hear who's coming in for the 2000. Well, hold on. It's no, not, we can't it's say. Not it's going to happen. It's Wait not till official. You, I'll tell you in the mic. No, okay. You. All right. Fresh Pod every Monday and Thursday <laughs> blog posts on Wednesday Him? video content. Really? <laughs> You've got that guy? We did. Wow. It's <laughs> Later. Later.